So last year, um, we had a bit of a heated debate, actually, around whether the industry was facing an evolutionary or a revolutionary challenge. And I am very much in the camp that we are in this, uh, a revolutionary one. I think the slide puts it quite well, because we are in one of the most transformative periods of our, of our industrial history. And we are moving into what's been called, a lot, and I love this term, the age of connected intelligence. And where we've come from is we life started to some extent with, a, with, a, with our, an agri-based economy that lasted for about 150 years. We then moved to the Industrial Revolution, that shrunk to 70 years. We then got to the Information Age, and it's 40 years, and you get the team. We're in the face with a, with a shrinking innovation gap. So that presents its own challenges. There has never been anything like the scale and pace of change which we face today. And, and what's going on is disrupting just about every industry in, in, in every country. So really you're looking at, we're living in a world of explosive innovation where predictability is almost impossible. And that means that agility, and core business agility, and allied to that will be technical agility, becomes absolutely essential. Now, when we're talking about the digital ecosystem, there are many different ways of looking at it, a lot of aspects to it. But I find it useful just to think about it in terms of three interacting perspectives. The changing nature of the customer we're dealing with, explosive technology innovation, and the disruption that we're seeing in types of business models that are emerging and the traditional models that are collapsing. Now, allied to that, there's a fourth. You can't get away from security and regulation, and that acts as something as a drag factor on the change that we're seeing here. But for me, pushing the boat out a little bit, the single most important aspect of the digital ecosystem today is the emergence of artificial intelligence as a mature technology. That is going to change, and to some extent is already changing, just about everything in our industry and possibly within the broader society itself. So it's, 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 it's a huge change factor that needs to be dealt with, and I'm going to cover a little bit of that later. So let's just start with the customer piece. Last year, you might recall, we talked about the millennials, and you saw it in the, in the opening um, video. It was all about millennials, and in fact, the millennials have been capturing the headlines for the last couple of years. There's been a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt generated by the automotive uh, newspaper and automotive media in particular. They are, you know, they connected uh, to digital natives, they were connected, they were online, they hated the dealer channel experience, and in fact, they weren't that interested in buying cars in the first place. Now, they're going with the, so the challenge has got a little bit worse because we're now going to be joined by what the Americans call Gen Z, or Generation Z. So between these two groups, they're going to account for 61% of the population. And by 2020, you're talking about a combined purchasing power of close to $5 trillion in the US. So that's a very significant piece. And millennials today are obviously a significant car buying um, percentage in their own right. But we're talking about well over half the, I know, half the planet here. So it's a very significant grouping. Now, while these two groups share a love of online, they're actually quite different. And the key difference for me is the millennials are something of a silver spoon generation. Whereas Gen Z are reared in the, in the, during the economic crisis. So they're a much more pragmatic bunch. And, it, and as it turns out, when it comes to the car buying experience, they actually want a face-to-face -face transaction. If you recall, the millennials was all supposed to be about the, you know, an online interaction. So Gen Z, on the other hand, they like a face-to-face -face interaction. So perhaps the dealer channel's demise uh, just isn't going to happen as soon as we might think. Now, it may, online's still really crucially important, and you know, think more and more is going to go online, but both those channels are going to exist. It also turns out that the, the doomsayers around the millennials in terms of not wanting to buy cars turned out to be completely false, and I never believed it in the first place. We're talking about 84% of the old, millennials tend to split it. It's actually two groups, older and younger, is how they split them up, because they're actually a little bit different. <laughs> But 84% of the older millennials and 50% of the younger already own a car. So this is a very significant um, car um, buying part of the public. So they, they remain really important. You are, however, going to have to deal with Gen Z also. Now, they, they, they are, the Gen Zs are, are known as, as effectively uh, technoholics. So their understanding and their use of technology is far deeper than even the millennials. So you're not just talking about online, you're talking about people who are prepared to actually manipulate your online presence. Um, so that needs to be taken into account. And most of you, from when we talk to our customers, you, know, you get a lot of talk about the, the omni-channel. And yes, you have to have the omni-channel. But I think you have to see that as omni-channel plus omni-segment, because you're dealing with two and maybe three different types of people, because there's Generation X as well. We still buy stuff, yeah? So now you've got three, you know, three significant segments to deal with, all different, and it's not just about the technology devices that people use. So when people say omni-channel, you know, people tend to think of it just in terms of devices that get, you, get, that get used, but it's not about that. It's about creating a personalized experience that fits the segment you're dealing with. And that's really, you know, it's doable, but it's tricky. And it's expensive because you have to go across all of these channels and you have to be able to move between them. It's quite difficult to do. 
So as I said, for me, the biggest and most important innovation, technically speaking, is artificial intelligence. I would say it is the most transformative innovation um, that we have seen, in, certainly in my lifetime, anyway, for sure. And it is, a, it's a, it is going to change, and I said, and it is significantly changing a lot of things today. It's the technology that gives rise to things like self-driving cars. The self-driving car is essentially is a piece of artificial intelligence on wheels. That's the best way to think about it. Couldn't do it without artificial intelligence. Um, image recognition, the voice recognition that you see on your phones, Google, you know, Google Assist, Siri. Um, you've the recent launch by Amazon of Amazon Echo and Alexa. That's all artificial intelligence. Um, and what's happened is, uh, well, first of all, the goal around artificial intelligence, they're trying to create software that thinks. No, no, no small achievement you can do. Now, they have not been able to create um, and mimic general purpose human intelligence. I mean, it's based on, artificial intelligence is based on, you know, uh, mimicking neural networks that you would see in the human brain. They have not been able to um, mimic general purpose human intelligence, at least not yet, but some feel that's coming. If and when that comes, that really will change absolutely everything. But what they have been really good at is two subfields within artificial intelligence that are really important. So you've got a thing called machine learning, and within that, a thing called uh, deep learning. Now, they have been phenomenally successful in this area. And a lot of clever stuff going on here in London, actually. Um, Imperial College and a few of the universities are really, really good at it. And I went to a couple of sessions on this over the last year or so, in roomfuls of PhDs, half the stuff I couldn't understand. But there's no doubting the kind of impact that it's going to have and the impact that it, it is already having. So what it turns out to be great at is pattern recognition, whether that be voice, text, or images. Also really, really good on natural language processing. Now that opens up a whole world of opportunities for you, which I'll come to in a second. But what, the reason this is happening now is we have the algorithms that they that are using on the artificial intelligence side, you know, they got a lot better. There's a huge amount of free, massive data sets, data, sets, data sets available on the internet, and you combine that with really cheap purchasing power, not, not processing power rather, from uh, general per GPUs. That combination has allowed the creation of self-learning software. That's really, really important, because prior to this, they had to train these, these, these pieces of software, very expensive to do, need a lot of uh, data scientists to get it done. Now you don't have to do that. So it's actually very, very cost effective, and it's working really, really well. As I said, it opens up a world of opportunities. I mentioned the, the, the connected vehicle. That's what AI is driving that. Uh, image re and pattern recognition, voice recognition. The world of chatbots, which we'll come to again. This has moved, you know, the old-fashioned digital assistant. Now we have chatbots that can interact with you as if I was a human being on a, on a website. Um, and then big data itself would be useless without the artificial intelligence algorithms that go behind it, making that data useful. As an example of what's going on here, IBM Watson is, I mean, most of you would have heard of IBM Watson, the IBM supercomputer, the one that won the Jeopardy game. Yeah, okay. So IBM have now, have now positioned themselves, have created a whole business around this piece. And what they've done is they've made Watson and their artificial intelligence software available on a cloud-based platform as a software as a service. So it becomes much more available and a lot more cost-effective to use. And the proof of that is in actually the usage it already has. Last year, last time I looked at it, there were over 45 financial institutions using this service in the areas of risk and compliance. So already it's making its way mainstream into our industry. I know that uh, BMW, for instance, in Europe, are using the Watsons, they're experimenting with it to manage some of their, um, their customer services in terms of, of email traffic. So, you go, so it's become very real in our industry and it's going to be, we're going to see more of that. And how big a change are we talking about here? I don't think McKinsey's are actually understating it here. But we're talking about something that is going to have something, what they say, 300, you know, 3,000 times the impact of the, uh, you know, of the industrial revolution. That's no small change. So this has taken over, um, you know, it's going to reach every aspect of our lives. Companies like Google, um, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're all spending fortunes in this. In fact, Google is repositioning its business to be an AI-centric business. Now, if we want to get in on this game, this is what you'd have to compete with. So, and what they, there's a war on the moment between all these guys, there's effectively a war for talent in, in this area. So it is the hottest topic in Silicon Valley. So one of the innovations that, that AI gives rise to is what I'm going to call intelligent portals. Because everybody talks about self-service, but if you think of your port and the kind of portals that you've got today, but if you talk about them as intelligent portals, we're looking at a slightly different um, experience. So all of you who are considering digital must be considering the, the customer journey and the customer experience. 
okay? Because today, technology is the lens through which your customers are going to experience you and your service. So what you do online is absolutely key and the experience is key. Now to make it work, that experience has to be seamless, it has to be end-to-end, -end, and most of all, it has to be simple and intuitive. Now the problem with that is that designing for simple and intuitive, because simple and intuitive, that's the key to digital success in my mind. If you can make it simple and intuitive, then you will be successful online. But designing for simple and intuitive, that's really difficult. And I like the words of Elon Musk puts it quite, re quite well. If it needs a manual, it's broken. And you'd have to ask ourselves, how many of us roll out systems where we know we have no training attached to it and we know user guide? We don't, we don't tend to do that because, because we don't know how. Because okay, designing for simple is, is, actually, is, is actually very, very, very hard. However, that's what Google and Amazon do all the time. They roll out stuff. We don't get training manuals, and we don't, uh, and we don't get, we don't get any training. And the stuff works, and people use it. That's what your customers are going to expect because that's what they're used to. That's their experience, so they'll expect the same from you. You're all going to have to go self-serve. If you're talking about digital, digital, it has to be self-serve. Yes. So you can't train all your customers, and even if you produce the manual, nobody is going to read it. So I could ask a question around, around in terms of people's plans and, and strategies around the, the digital. So if we're talking about the customer journey, we're talking about digital customer journey, can I ask you, how many of you have included voice interaction in that journey? Okay, two out of the entire room. Now, today, 10%, well, even not today, last year, by even last year, 10% of the online activity um, was done through voice interaction. I don't know about you, but we have a teenage, we have a teenage son, and all we hear all day around the kitchen table is, okay, Google, and he asks the question, and hey, presto, Google gives him the answer. Or it's hey, Siri, whatever, whatever your, your choice is. That stuff actually works. AI has made a transformational change in the area as is pattern recognition, but in this case, voice recognition. So it is now becomes quite feasible to include voice interaction in your customer journey. And in fact, you're probably going to have to. Because the prediction is within the next few years, 50% of the online traffic will be by, uh, be by uh, voice interaction. And you're talking about an intu you know, trying to be s uh, simple and intuitive. How much more simple and intuitive is a, vo is a conversation with your system than what we do today? It's a lot more intuitive, and the stuff works. So I think that's where people will need to go, and that's where, where, where it will go. On top of this, you know, we have to consider how we manage our customer relationships. Because one of the challenges when you go online is how do you actually maintain a relationship? So how do you actually create that, that, that human touch and that human feeling? Well, again, AI has come to the rescue here because we now have the world of um, the chatbot technology, which means you can have a human-esque type conversation with your, with, your, with your platform. So you have these one-to-one -one uh, interactions with your customer, whether that be voice or text, so that it feels like you are getting a personalized service. And indeed, because of the way these, these things are, are, are constructed, you are, in effect, getting a personalized service. It also has an added benefit that in the world of where compliance has become increasingly important, you can guarantee that you have a, a compliant conversation with your customer because they're having that conversation effectively with a so-called bot. Um, so what I like to think about of it is, is it's like almost like mass one-to-one -one relationships. It's a pretty good solution for the kind of challenge that we've got here. Okay, the other piece that, uh, that AI has helped with is um, making big data real. I've talked about some of this last year. Let's bring up this one as well. Um, we have seen an emergence of alternative data models for credit scoring. And some of these have uh, proved to be, to be quite, um, quite aggressive uh, and quite successful. So traditionally, credit scoring is based on a small number of what we class statistically as strong variables. And in the alternative world of big data and artificial intelligence, you're talking about credit models being based on a huge number of weaker variables. So a good example is Zest Finance. Um, in 2012, they were outperforming the, the finance market. They were doing this in the, in the sub uh, personal subprime lending uh, by about 33%. That meant their bad, their bad debt uh, default rate was, was one third better than, than the alternatives, which is, a huge, um, which is a huge advantage when you think about that kind of a market. Um, they were analyzing you know, something like 70,000 variables, multiple data models, and in true big data fashion, 10% um, of the customers they were doing were listed as dead, it made no difference to the model. There was no single customer for which they had all information, so they're dealing with messy and loose data and using the AI routines to come up with the right answers. Um, and they have, been, they have been very successful with it. 
That whole concept was taken uh, by the Chinese, and they've created this Chinese um, social credit system, which I would have mentioned before as well. Now, this is trying to establish the credit worthiness of every Chinese citizen. A unique feature of the Chinese market, of course, is that there isn't much credit data to be had. We have a system with, um, with Volkswagen Finance. We've installed a, put, a, put a system into, into China. And you know, doing credit decisioning is quite difficult because it's very difficult to get the kind of data that you get, you get in the Western world. But they've been quite successful here. Alibaba has run a pilot on, 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 on their Sesame Credit system. That's happening now. That's turning out to be quite successful. And what, again, they're doing is they're using a huge amount of disparate type of data and AI algorithms to come up with um, a, a credit worthiness factor for, uh, for their citizens. Recently, Baidu. Um, took an investment, uh, we made an investment in Zest Finance. So that technology, and the guy who runs this is the ex-CIO um, ex of Google. So it's all quite serious stuff. What it does do for us is it could transform credit decisioning because it could open up a lot of the emerging markets, it could open up the subprime market, and it could open up all the tin file customers that you have to deal with, like Gen Z and Gen Y. Okay? However, one of the things that's changed since last year, because last time I looked at this, there was a lot of talk about using the big data and artificial intelligence, and linking it in to the likes of in the social networks, the likes of, the likes of Facebook. Actually, Facebook um, acquired a patent last year so that you could run credit worthiness based on a friend's network within Facebook. But they have decided to pull the pilot on it. They're not going to do it. Now, my understanding is that's because they're a little bit concerned about the um, consumer protection and their reputation around that. Some of it might also be, be regulation. However, these other guys, there's lots of new players on the market. They're full steam ahead, and they're going to go for it. We also have to factor in, I'm going to call it the intelligent vehicle. As I mentioned, this is a self-driving car or the connected car. I mean, this, it is, as I said, an artificial intelligence machine. It's become quite sophisticated. If you look at, uh, in terms of the computing power that's in there, we're talking about an F-22 fighter has two million lines of code, and your car now has 100 million. That's a pretty sophisticated um, computer environment to have to deal with, and it's a lot of stuff that could go wrong as well, to be fair. Um, and a lot of that would be buried in terms of the uh, artificial intelligence capability that's gone in there. Now, we're going to see with this, we're going to see a shift, uh, a shift to, from products to services. And the data itself that's available inside a connected vehicle is going to be commercially valuable. And we will talk about that, and, and John Ellis will talk about some of that in his talk later on. Um, something like wait, wait, you know, wiper data becomes a valuable commodity that can be sold. It's also going to open up, because the car guys, as in the OEMs, have to deal with this world. And from a finance perspective, you have to see then, what can we do to leverage the opportunities that might create? Because there's a whole world of opportunities. The more, you know, some of the obvious ones I've stuck up here. For example, um, the dynamic insurance products, which we're already seeing today. You can take that data off your ODB drive or stick. That goes through, and you can have a more personalized you know, quote for, for insurance. And you can get better quotes for, for, you know, for, the, for teenagers in terms of their first insurance um, uh, product. Also things like you know, floor plan. I mean, one of the biggest costs in a floor plan environment is the actual physical stock checks you have to run. If you go to you know, some of our customers in the US, you know, this is a massive country, you have to employ thousands of people to check whether the, where the car is. Well, a connected car, you don't have to do that, because if it drives off the lot, it's going to tell you yourself that it's gone there, and then it can trigger, it can trigger a payment autom automatically by linking back to your system. Um, we also have to consider the situation where the car now becomes part of your digital experience. If I've got voice recognition, why can't I, you know, while I'm driving along in my car, have, you know, speak to your system and say, I'd like to get a settlement quote and have that conversation while I'm driving and have the transaction completed. We'll show later on with, uh, with DocuSign, our, our e-signature partner, we'll show you what a, uh, an example of what an in-car uh, e-signature experience looks like where they're actually signing up the customer and signing the documents inside the car itself using the car's uh, own facilities. So, bigger question around this, because I guess everybody you know, knows the connected vehicle is there. There's a little bit of doubt around you know, when are we going to see full-blown self-driving uh, self vehicles. I think that's going to happen a lot quicker than people think. But one of the big challenges we can face with here is who's going to own the data? Because, and who owns the customer relationship? So even if you own the data, who's going to own the relationship? Because customer relationships are based on interactions. Who are you going to have the interaction with if you're in the car? So it's no secret that, 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 uh, that Google, uh, and Apple are fighting really, really hard to get inside the vehicle and be the ones controlling the, 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 the headset experience. If they do, do they end up all in the customer relationship? What do you lose by doing that? Um, because whoever owns that 
you know, is going to rule the world in terms of where this pit stop sits. So it's a really, really important test. And I wonder how the OEMs are going to compete with the likes of Google and Apple to create the kind of in-car experience that those guys just seem to be able to do naturally. And that will be a big, big challenge. And it might come down to whether the car companies have to stand up and say, actually, are we a car company or do we need to be a tech company? Or where do we sit on that, on that curve? And I wouldn't like to bet on, you know, if you have to take on the likes of Google for a customer experience, that's a tough gig. But, you know, that not, not, doesn't mean it can't be done, but it's a tough gig. And as I said, this needs to be part of what we class as your one digital life. We talked about the intelligent portal. You know, that needs to bring your customer experience together in a single portal, and you have this concept of a one digital life, so all of the digital experiences need to come in. But you need to factor this in as well, because now the car is going to become part of that world. You know, I'll have my phone, I'll have my laptop, I'll have my iPad, whatever, and now I have my connected vehicle. All those things have to be factored in. Something a little bit more, more, more mundane is um, what we call um, in White Clark digital processing, a combination of e-signatures combined with EID combined with self-billing. I know from some of the, the on-the-ground work we did in terms of assessing the impact of this, we're looking at easily you can get a 60% headcount saving in terms of your, your, your onboarding processes today. So just from a cost perspective, it's quite good. But it's absolutely essential for an online journey. I mean... You can't really have a digital experience where you want to sell finance if you don't have e-signatures. And what I find remarkable is how little of it there is out there. I mean, people are doing it, but it's not that, you know, you'd have thought at this stage that everybody would be doing it. Um, it also, you know, when we talk about it, um, one of the pushbacks we get from our customers as well, what about compliance and security? It's far more compliant and secure than playing around with paper. I mean, because most of you today, you know, if you're taking stuff through on fax and you're paying out in a fax, you'll take a fax copy of the, of the passport or driver's license, and during the busy periods, maybe the fax image isn't so good, so what do people do? They just assume it's okay and off it goes, right? Which is a lot less compliant and secure than this. However, one word of caution here, that I, you know, this stuff looks fairly easy because, you know, I'm just signing or I'm clicking to sign. It doesn't look that complicated. You can get it wrong too quite easily. So it's not a place to, um, to trust to what I'm going to call the cowboys. You need to make sure that what you do here a, you know, stacks up, works, is actually secure and audible, and that it will meet the legal challenges that could come to you. Again, covered some of this last year. It's interesting to see how fast this has moved. Um, I mean, 3D printing is a, is a, is a fantastic technology. You know, in 2014, we had the first prototype. That was the uh, Chicago Motor Show. We printed that car. 2015... Lamborghini are actually using 3D printers to create actual parts. And in 2016, we had Oli. I know some people will be familiar with Oli. So it's effectively a printed vehicle. Uh, and they have included inside of it the IBM Watson facilities. So it's got artificial intelligence inside. And that's used to actually communicate with the passengers. So now you've got a pretty good prototype of where the world might, might go. It would create some interesting challenges for us. If we're going to be in this world, uh, how would your car configurator work? I mean, if I'm going to print my part, what, what would I actually be configuring? And more importantly, how would my RVs be calculated? And what would I be talking about in terms of remarketing? I might, I might just be into when it comes to the, when the vehicle comes back off a fleet, do I just reprint it or do I remarket it? That, it's not here today, but it's a world that's coming. One of the reasons it's going to come faster than people might think is the US Department of Defense are actually taking 3D printers effectively onto the battlefield. Uh, and they're actually supporting the UK, Australia, and I can't remember the other country, in terms of getting this technology into the military here. Because what they're trying to do is to shrink their supply chains. Now, what that means for us is, once these guys get it, because remember, the people who invented the internet, actually, at the end of the day, right, the, the underlying structure was DARPA, was with the US Department of Defense, effectively. Okay, so once these guys get at it, they're going to make this stuff really, really work. If they're prepared to trust this stuff to make components on the battlefield, which would put their soldiers' lives at risk, you can be sure it's going to work. So that will, I think, we will see an acceleration here, which will be, which will be good news for us. Talked a little bit about this as well <clears throat> in terms of the, the digital channel. You have to consider social media. Question would be, you know, does social media become the new customer service channel? Well, last year, we talked about it, uh, and there were some surveys done, and quite a few people, you know, 42% here, said they would like to have their customer services via social media. More recent one, gave us the reverse result. Here, they put it right down, because actually it's a bit tricky to do. So I, my suspicion is this, is this is around the usability, and I think chatbots 
will change the way that actually works. And I don't know if you know, but you know, Facebook are investing very, very heavily in chatbots. So I think we'll see this thing go back to, to, the, to, the, to the survey type, type results we have in the blue box above. But either way, you have to include this in your omni-channel and omni-segment experience. It has got to be, there's going to have to be one of the channels that you deal, deal, deal with. Now, no conversation around digital would be complete without something around, or around security. So security and regulation, no surprise to anybody here, the, the level of regulation is increasing and it's going to continue to increase. I mean, we're seeing an, in, an interesting battle between the European Union and Google. We saw the striking down the safe harbor agreement that turned into the privacy shield, and we're just going to see more of it. Um, I'll go over back to the US quite a bit, uh, and the CFPB over there is, is a bit of a trailblazer in terms of um, regulation. And I would suspect that that will become the kind of standard that we're going to see here. And they are very aggressive. Um, and I don't know if you remember, they, they, they recently um, they defined Ali something like $100 million uh, for, for, well, for activity uh, discriminating against their customers. And you, know, you could say, if that kind of standard were brought here, then lots of us would have, would have to have uh, interesting conversations. So the regulation is going to increase. And, and from a digital perspective and your digital customer journey, that's just more work, so you've, but you've got to do it. Equally, there is a real and present threat from, from you know, security threats. The most recent one we've seen was the Tesco Bank, so you've seen that. There's been a lot of that stuff, so, so that's happening. And again, from a digital perspective, you have to get your head around that. And the problem with this is that actually, from a technology perspective, it's really tough to do. I mean, security software development is a very tough gig, but it has to be done. And it becomes like, absolutely vital because you know, if I don't feel secure, I'm not going to take the digital journey. And if you look at how long it takes for your brands to build trust, and the years and years that have gone into that, well, one hack and you're dead. You know, and then your brand trust is gone. And that's going to be, you know, so, so you, you've, got, you've got to deal with it. Now, it's not, we're not without um, hope. Um, I'm just going to pick out one with somebody, there's a couple of guys going to speak about blockchain later on today, so I'm not going to go into it. But this is one area that people, is, people are pointing out from a security perspective, this whole concept of a distributed ledger. Um, lots of the financial services organizations have taken a big interest in this, something like 50 of the mainstream banks and Toyota Financial Services are having a look as well. Um, so it does, it's, an, it's, a, it's a technology with a lot of hope, um, and it's seen as being tamper-proof. Also, as a byproduct, there's, there's a considerable cost saving because third parties are taken out of the transactions. However, there's a much bigger problem looming for us because all of our uh, security from a technology perspective is based on a very old standard when I was going to college, RSA, I can't remember, the, it's, it's the name of three guys actually, but the way that actually works is, is a public and private, private key encryption. I can encrypt with a public key and only the person with the private key can un decrypt that and, and get my message. And that's how all of it, including the blockchain, okay? So it's all based on this stuff here. Now, it works, it's secure simply because the way in which these encryption codes are created is effectively the product of very large prime numbers. And to decrypt it, you need something like, in, if you went back 10 years, you'd need thousands of years of that kind of computing power to do it. Right? The bad news is, of course, that computing power is increasing. So that's, uh, while it's still a phenomenal challenge with traditional computing and probably still can't be broken using that, it is not such a phenomenal challenge when we come to the concept of quantum computing. Now, this is an area of research that's been has taken over the last few years, and it's getting it's, it's not it's not fully there yet, but it's getting better. However, there was a successful uh, experiment run in MIT, and they cracked this code with relative ease. Now, once we are facing a threat like that, and um, we have to think about what we're going to do about it. And there is a new technology again based on quantum computing, which is quantum key distribution, and that actually pretty much guarantees your security. Now, it's technology that actually works, so they've proven it. It's just not commercially viable at the moment. Now, the reason that's important for us is, from a digital perspective, because we're going to face with this challenge, and, and you know, the, the American security organization in particular are very worried about what might actually happen here. We're going to have to solve this problem. There is no, there's no way out of it, because once, the, once, the, once people start to be able to crack those kind of codes, then everything becomes up for grabs. So we're going to see some innovations here. And once we get them, that will make the digital channel as a byproduct extremely secure. So we'll be in a much better place. And our customers then will, be, will feel a lot more confident about using our technology. Okay, so that's a little bit around the technology piece I wanted to go through. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the, the third perspective, which was around business model disruption. 
So I would have covered again some of this before, but just to recap very quickly, if you look at what happened to Borders, a $100 million business got put out of business by Amazon, not because people stopped reading books. All that changed was the user experience. That's the way I, thought I like to look at it. And they missed out on that. So we're still reading, reading far more books than we ever did. Same thing happened to photographs. It's not that we stopped taking photographs, just the, the, the medium through which we do it, the experience that the customer wants, that's what they missed here. And it wasn't about technology, because BlackBerry, which, you know, that was a fantastic technology. You know, there was the CrackBerry and so on. It was, you know, t technically very good. And that was what, nearly a $50 billion company gone. And again, what did they miss out on? Lots of things they got wrong, but one of the things they got wrong was the whole world of apps. So they missed the whole user experience and didn't move with the way in which the user experience was, was, uh, was, was emerging. Likewise, for us, in terms of our industry, we have to be very conscious, as I said, you know, smart and intuitive, what kind of customer and user experience are you going to provide? Because it has to be the right one, because whoever gets that right is going to win. Um, you know, we look at these, uh, one of the pushbacks they get when we talk about these is, well, you know, that's, that's, that's books, it's, it's photographs, you know, it's not, the, it's not car finance, it's not, it's not the car industry. Well, you know, maybe we can get disrupted as well. Um, Google has had a banking license since 2007. Amazon started lending to their SMEs in 2012. And this year, Amazon are now offering a monthly payout, effectively finance online through their website. And we'll see more of that. Um, and as I said, Google and Apple are, are, are locked in a, in, a, in a battle for control of the dashboard. So the question is, what's next for us? And are we immune to this kind of disruption? I don't think we are. And again, Amazon have brought out Amazon, a website called Amazon Vehicle. Uh, and what you're looking at there is creating a, a, they're not selling cars per se, but they are selling car parts. And they are using the Amazon technology to push you through to their, car, uh, their, their spare parts channel. So these things are, are, are emerging quite rapidly. That didn't exist a year ago. So let's look a little bit around some of the disruption that we're talking about here. My good friend John Ellis is going to talk about the zero dollar car concept we, we visited last year. But if we look at this and, and we talk about the intelligent vehicle, the connected vehicle, then we said we're moving from product to services and the, and the, the raw material for those services is the data. So the data has a, has a value in its own right. So, for, uh, so we could have a situation where we could say, for example, that I am going to pay the customer for their wiper data. So I want to sell you a car, and if you, if you allow me to have all your wiper data for the rest of your life, then I'm going to give you, I don't know, say a 20% discount on that car, and so on for different um, data aspects that will be available from your vehicle. Now, that's fine for the car guys, because they can, they can get into that arrangement, and then I can resell that data to the weather companies, and they can save themselves a fortune, but they you know, don't have to go through a whole pile of base station development across the country to give good, solid weather predictions. I can just use the wiper data. If there's 10 vehicles sitting in an area, and the wipers are going like this, and I know that in real time, it's pretty certain that it's raining. Okay, so again, that's all pretty valuable for these people. So I pay you for that, and I give you, I give you a 20% reduction on your, on your car. And the car company sells that on, so they get their money, they're making money. Well, what happens to the finance people? If we took this piece to its logical conclusion, and I bought all of the possible data, and I gave you the car for free, or even if I give you the car for 50% of its price because I've taken as much data as I want, then the question becomes, what is it you're going to finance? What would be left to finance? Because in a situation like that, the, ga the value of the vehicle that you can go to finance has dropped by 50%. The car company's doing OK, but you're going to have a problem. Well, the one a little bit more complex to deal with is the, you know, the era of, of new mobility and where all this connected vehicle and artificial intelligence stuff is going to go. If we look at this box here, we're more or less in, 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 uh, in, in box A today. Okay, so we're talking about traditional car finance, the big changes that in, along with the dealer channel, the, the online direct channel is becoming much more important. And we're dealing with a, with a sort of incremental change. If I move up to box C and I move from you know, this, this was, you know, I personally own the vehicle and I'm driving it myself here. I still own the vehicle, but I'm going to use more of the self-driving capability, where that's full, full self-drive or some, some additional safety features. The good news is I'm going to have a more sophisticated vehicle, so it'll probably have a bigger price tag, so you get to finance more. That's, that's worth something. Um, and also, in that, in that world, you'll have the option around financing over-the-air services. So a bit like what Tesla do, and that becomes important because you can just release capability into a car, and you can finance the release of that. And it's almost like a zero cost to you. you know, you're just financing its availability. Somebody hits the software switch, and it's available. Uh, one downside would be, if we've got greater safety features in the car, we're going to need to have less accidents, probably have less spare parts and repairs to deal with, so there'll be less uh, less business to be done in that area. 
We moved it to, to, to box B, then we're more, you know, it's, it's, we've now moved to a kind of a shared world, so that the whole world of vehicle sharing, whether that's personal sharing or whether we're talking about share rides, you're then really more in a fleet than you are a retail type environment. And from a system perspective, that's how we, do, how we think about it. Because once you move to the car sharing world, it's more of a retail type transaction. I'm going to call them mi micro rents. We did some stuff with one of our customers in China a couple of years ago, and we were talking about um, putting a pool of vehicles in, in, in one of their, under the skyscrapers they have. In Beijing, they just have these skyscrapers with, with like hundreds of thousands of people in them, it feels like. Cars parked at the bottom, you come down with your card, swipe it in, you get a micro rental and you drive it across town and an hour later, it's, it's parked somewhere else. So that's car sharing, you know, microfinance in that sense. Um, you might also be in the world of, of, of ride sharing. So again, it still, it still becomes a fleet type environment. Uh, and you might be ha having to deal with a range of assets. So you might sell some kind of mobility package that covers you know, not just a car, but it covers other um, mobile type environments like you know, a train journey or whatever, a flight or whatever. And then we'd look, talk about um, box D, which would be the new age of, of accessible uh, um, uh, autonomy. And here, uh, one, of the actually, one of the CEOs in a big automotive company in Europe, he described it as, uh, as we'll be financing RoboCab. It was being quite derogatory, but, um, but it's, well, it's not a bad term. Um, and here we're talking about a situation where, what if we now have, have a world that's gradually, and the, the, the belief would be that we're, we're gradually moving towards box D, over, that's, that's where the world is going. So if I get into a situation where we are talking about effectively utility vehicles, I use 3D printing to print them, um, and, and then I'm just going to rent them to you for usage, where does that leave everybody? I mean, the dealer in that world then becomes more of a, a mobility manager. Now, so instead of the role that they're playing today, they might have to look at it quite differently. And in this space, you'll also be competing with the likes of, of Uber. I mean, while we got Uber for car, you know, car sharing, you, know, you can get your, everybody knows you can go on your app and you get your, your car ride from Uber. But they would like to get into this space as well. I mean, they're investing fairly heavily in artificial intelligence and they're investing in self-driving vehicles. So in their world, if they can rock up with a car with no driver, it's a lot cheaper for them. These will be utility vehicles. How many people then are going to want to own their own car? Where is that going to sit? That whole experience. So from a finance perspective, I mean, the car guys might be okay because they've still got to build the vehicles. You know, you're still going to want some, you know, people are, some people are still going to want to drive. They'll probably want to have fun drives at the weekend. I might sell you two or three different cars because I moved to this world of car sharing. It might be personal car sharing where I can have a, a piece of three different types of vehicles or I can choose which ones I want for the weekend or during the week. But it does leave a question mark as to uh, when we get into that space, what happens in the finance here. Also leaves, um, leaves a question as we're not going to move to any one of these boxes tomorrow and it's not going to be one box. We're going to move to a situation where all four are going to be present. So you're going to have to deal with all four. And that's, that's a bit like the whole omni-channel thing. It just gets more expensive and more difficult to do. And I know of no system today that can handle all four of these things simultaneously. So another aspect, you know, just another example is disruption. You all would have heard of the, you know, the, the, the hype around fintech and peer-to-peer and, and -peer finance. So so-called platform uh, as a business. Interestingly, we look at what they're trying to do, and it is growing quite rapidly, so it is a, it is a real and present threat. Um, they're matching borrowers to, to so-called investors, so people who want to buy stuff and people who want to sell stuff, uh, or, or people who want to give you money. Um, and they are using the non-traditional credit models to do this. So they're able to access a wider audience, so it is, again, back to the AI and big data piece. And for them, the key to success in that world, and they recognize themselves, is the customer experience, mobile and intuitive. Now, in you know, for, from our perspective, you know, disruption doesn't have to be a one-way street. It doesn't have to be all bad. So, for example, just you know, things you could think of off the, off the top of your head. What if, um, if the OEMs decided to create a, their own online used car market? Right? And what you'd be in a situation, then you, you'd be, you would be matching you know, borrower to investor or be matching your own customer to your, your other own customers. So they would be your customers. You would have full knowledge about those customers. You know a great deal about their credit history because they have their finance with you. You also know a great deal about the vehicles in this pool because they're your cars. Right, so you've got some pretty good um, information that nobody else is going to have. Nothing to stop you doing a platform as a business in competition. And indeed, you could open that up and you could say, why don't all the capitals to get together and put it all together on one platform, become a platform of business, and you keep all those vehicles and all that used car market inside your, 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 your own, we'll call it a club. Not, a, not hugely different from the way in which the US does, does uh, um, credit 
if you, you know, the, the captives are all on, on uh, dealer track or route one, they own a share in route one and they, they create one system and they, they push it all through that. So disruption could also be an opportunity. Right, that's a, that's a lot of pressure um, on, the, on the finance organization. We've got all these coming at you, so it's a pretty difficult, it's a pretty difficult challenge. Well, what would you do? Well, for me, if I was to summarize it, I would say there's two things we can do, or two things we should do. First of all, there's, um, there's innovation and this concept of internal disruption. You don't all, you know, it's, you have a choice. Are you going to be the hunter or are you going to be hunted? And that is a real choice, and that's about a mindset, and there's no reason why you can't fight back. And from an IT perspective, you know, as a technology guy, I think it's all around platforming. So not about point solutions, but about creating a platform. Combination of agile technology, great customer experience, and this concept of microservices orchestration. So where you're creating a, a user experience at the front, which is calling services at the back, and those services wouldn't necessarily just sit, say, in a finance company. Because in, in the new world of car buying and online, I'm going to need to bring the OEM and the finance company together. So if I can orchestrate those, if, they're, if their core services are presented as services, then I am creating a user experience on top of that, and I'm simply calling these things true. true. And so long as I can orchestrate them and, and configure them in that way, then we're, we're, in a, we're in a far better place to create a great experience. And it's going to be naturally agile, because there's a need new services. They can switch, one out, switch a new one in or just add to it. It's a lot more agile than what we have today. Now, it's, I always find it a bit difficult to get my head on and all this stuff, so I use this diagram myself just as a kind of a way of, of, of thinking about it. It's just useful in terms of, 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 a, of a team. And I look at it that what we're trying to do is you're platforming to create an agile um, customer experience. Okay? So if you look at the kind of things you're trying to do, it needs to be personalized, so it needs to be built around you as the customer. Um, it needs to be transparent. Um, that's a big thing on online uh, that we don't actually, you hear a lot in, in, in other countries, you don't hear a lot of it here. It really needs to be transparent because one of the big customers you know, aren't trying to squeeze the last penny of saving out of their finance company. They just want to know they're getting a, a decent deal. So being transparent with pricing makes a big difference here. Right? And when you're online, that becomes quite crucial. It needs to be integrated, so you're in this whole managing your one digital life experience. It needs to be predictive, kind of knowing what, you know, again, just the kind of artificial intelligence piece, you know, it knows what you want to do before you know yourself. Um, it's smart, so it's going to learn and grow with you. And it's delightful, it's simple, intuitive, it's convenient, and built in here by, for free will be, will be compliance, because if, I, if I'm controlling this experience, I can make sure I do it in a in compliant manner. Now, at the center are the kind of technologies that we need to look at in order to facilitate a platform like this. And I still liked, you know, would say that agile technology is quite key for the future. It was key last year. It's going to be key going forward, because who knows what the world's going to bring us. And we, you've got no way of really knowing. All you can really say is actually it is going to change massively and continue to change massively within the, you know, over the next few years. So being agile is actually quite important. As I said, not just technology, but you know, an agile business. But you can't have an agile business unless you have agile technology because all your business processes are buried in some kind of technology. So to make them agile, you need agile technology. I also like a good way of thinking of it, just a one-liner, is that you're moving from a system of record to a system of engagement. If you look at traditionally where we come from, we tend to think in finance of a system of record. You know, if you actually look at when you're putting your systems in, we, we know who are the heavy hitters in terms of is this system fit for purpose? You know, a lot of it goes into the finance guys and the accounting piece and so on. Well, look, you just have to assume you're going to get that one right because you know we we, we do. Uh, but this this um, how are you going to engage your customers? Because that engagement is going to be online. And that's going to come down to technology. So I'm going to finish with this because we're all on a bit of a journey. And to be upfront and honest. Um, do I know a vendor who can do all of this, including White Clark? The answer is no, I don't, uh, because there isn't one. So we're on a bit of a journey, and my advice would be that if you want to get a system for the future, because when you platform, you're creating a foundation. You're not creating a system that you're going to use just for the next three years. You have got to create a platform that can handle the change and will be with you for the next 10 years. Otherwise, you're going to have to do, do all of this again, and that's going to be extremely, extremely difficult. So you need to get with somebody who can share your vision and, 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 and go on that journey with you. Thank you. <laughs>